Okay, good day. This will be our first lecture for our class, History 141 or G9, Results, Life and Works. The first lecture is entitled Rizal in the Context of 19th Century Philippines. Now, as I've said in the first video, it's important for us to understand the context of Rizal's time. We have to know what happened during his time in order to understand why he became who he is today. Now we have to look into four different developments. The first one is the economic development. The second one is the uh, political development. The third one is the cultural development. And then the last is the religious development. So 19th century Philippines is actually from 1800 to 1899. Now we have to look into the 19th century because as you all know Jose Rizal was born on June 19, 1861 and he died on December 30, 1896 so he was 35 years old and he lived during the latter half of the 19th century so it's very important for us to really look into what happened during this time in the Philippines now the first development that we'll discuss is the economic development. The first question is, why was there economic growth in the 19th century? Now if you look at the Philippines, the Philippines was a colony of Spain for more than 300 years, 333 years to be more specific about it. Now uh, the problem with the Philippines was that the Spaniards were very corrupt. And they monopolized the economy. But in the 19th century, there was a change, a positive change that happened. And this was the, tr the, the change from mercantilism, which was an economic system used to unify and increase the power and monetary wealth of a country by strict government regulation of trade and foreign trading monopolies, to a free trade, lazy fare economy. Now, what do we mean by this? What do we mean by a mercantilistic economy compared to a lazy fare economy? Now, I'll give you an example of a mercantilistic economy. Now, for a mercantilistic economy, imagine if the Philippines, say for example, wanted to import abaca to France. The thing is, they could not do this. They could not possibly import abaca to France. It is impossible for them to do this. Even if the price in France was much cheaper, the Philippines would be stuck. No, the Philippines would be stuck buying abaca from France. They could not. No, they could not uh, do this. So all the goods from the colony of the Philippines had to go to Spain. They cannot export goods from the Philippines to other countries like Spain, uh, like, like France, like England, like America, etc. And then what happens next is that Spain would then sell the goods to other countries at a substantial markup. Ilang patasaan ang presyo. No? They have profit, so to speak, which the crown not the colonists, not the people in the Philippines, but the royal crown, the king, the queen, and the royal family would benefit from. In short, the colonists did the work. They were the ones uh, tending to the farm. They were the ones harvesting it, sending it to Spain, but then it would be Spain that would reap the profit, not the Philippines. So. It was disadvantageous to the people of the Philippines while it was advantageous to the people of Spain, especially the, the royal family. So, this is it, no? The mercantilist economy was disadvantageous for colonists while it was advantageous to the motherland or the crown. Now, we have to look at how economic growth started in the 19th century. So looking back, the main, one of the main reasons why there was economic growth was because of the opening of the ports to world trade. 
when the ports open to world trade, when the ports of Cebu and then Iloilo and then Manila, when the ports open to world trade, uh, when the ports open to world trade, uh, people started, traders started to come to the Philippines. Not only Spanish traders, but other traders from other countries started to come to the Philippines. And this was uh, marked by the, the change from a mercantilistic economy to a laissez-faire economy. So, with the opening of the ports to world trade came in the rise of the export economy. Now, when we say rise of the export economy, this refers to the Filipinos being able to send products outside the Philippines to other countries. The reason why there was a rise of the export economy is mainly because of the opening of the ports to world trade. This was because of the increase in the demand for supplies. I think all of you know this. Uh, <clears throat> I think all of you, you know the supply and demand rule or law no? so when the demand increases of course the supply the supply likewise increases also so because there was an increase in the demand there was also then an increase in the supply so the filipinos especially the farmers and the tenants were then forced to produce more agricultural products due to the increase in the demand as a result, this eventually led to the rise of the Filipino middle and upper class. They were the tenants. The hacienderos, on the other hand, were the friars. So what the Filipino middle and upper class did was they rented land from the friars, and then they were the ones who tended to the farm. They hired farmers in order to harvest the crops, plant and harvest the crops. And then after they harvested it, they sent it to the traders who demanded those agricultural products like uh, abaca, tobacco, sugar, rice, corn, etc. And after sending it to the uh, traders, of course, they were able to reap the benefit from, uh, reap profit from it and got money from it eventually. So, when they started to accumulate money, they then used this money for what? What did they use it for? They used it for the education of their children. Now, we have to remember one thing first before we continue. In our discussions, this is the first part. The second part will be uploaded uh, in a week. In our discussions on the different developments, we have to find the answer to the question as to what was the reason why nationalism developed in the 19th century? Or how did the economic, political, cultural, and religious developments accelerate Filipino nationalism? So the first thing we have to do is discuss what were the developments, and then after discussing the developments, we then have to go into the discussion on how these developments accelerated Filipino nationalism. So. Going back, the rise of the Filipino middle and upper class then led to the education of Filipino children, their children, the likes of Rizal and other heroes like the Luna brothers, uh, even Del Pilar. So, what was the effect of the education of their children? Well, it's simple. The effect was that their children learned the spirit of nationalism in school. They were able to become nationalistic. Their views changed from a very naive view of Philippine history to a very nationalistic view of Philippine history. They were able to see the wrongdoings of the Spaniards. They were able to see the corruption that was rampant during their time. So, the education of the children of the Filipino middle and upper class eventually became a catalyst to the rise of Filipino nationalism. And the main reason for this is, of course, the opening of the ports to world trade.
it all boils down to this and then like a domino effect it led to the rise of the export economy and then the rise of the Filipino middle and upper class and then the education of their children so if one must ask how did it lead to the rise of Filipino nationalism well it's simple it's because of the education of their children their children learned the nationalistic fervor in school and they became you know their their views changed radically so to speak so that's the economic development now for the political development I would like to ask a question first as to what was the political situation in Spain during the 19th century well Spain in the 19th century was typified by the struggle between liberals and conservatives on the one hand the liberals were the people who wanted to fight for democracy they wanted the people to vote for their leader they wanted freedom of speech freedom of the press freedom of assembly etc etc while the conservatives wanted to remain with status quo what i mean by this is that the conservatives wanted to continue with the royal bloodline to continue with the government ruled by the royal family well the liberals did not want the royal family to continue to rule because they wanted to vote their own leader they wanted their leader to come from the people not the royal family so in the 19th century spain was characterized by intermittent uh intermittent civil wars and Spain lost most, if not all, of its colonies in South America in the 19th century because of these civil wars. There was a war between the liberals and the conservatives for most of the 19th century. So the colonies of Spain in South America include, you know, already Argentina, Colombia, Venezuela, uh, Chile, etc., Bolivia, Peru. Most of them started to gain even mexico gained its independence during the 19th century during the early part of the 19th century so how did this affect the philippines of course we can say that in the 19th century spain was characterized by political instability indeed there was political instability in spain because of the struggle between liberals and the conservatives but how did this affect the Philippines? Did it have a positive or negative effect? Of course, we can ascertain that it had a negative effect. It definitely had a negative effect. One of the negative effects of the political instability in Spain was the constant practice of replacing governor generals. Imagine from 1853 to 1898, there were 41 governor generals in a span of 45 years. What do you think is the effect of this to our country? I'll give you an ex I'll give you an analogy. Example, uh, say in Negros Oriental, we go at the local level. In Negros Oriental, we have year 2020. Our governor is uh, Roel de Gamo. And then after a few months, he's replaced by Lim Kai Chong. And then after a few months again, his, Lim Kai Chong is replaced by Sagar Baria. And then after a year, Sagar Baria is replaced by Tevez Gares, Arnie Tevez. And then after a month, Arnie is replaced by Bulado, Justin Bulado. How would that affect you? Wala ko ng ambition mga governor, but how would that affect you? How would that affect the people of Negros Oriental? Of course, it has a very, it has a very negative effect, even an egregious one. Why? Well, if you look at it, if the gan kaayo ang mga magpulihan ay if there are a lot of changes in the government officials, who will be the government official during what year or during 
a, a, a span of months or even weeks, there will be no consistent policies. Projects will not be finished and the policies will continuously change and that will definitely affect the people. We can then say that the Philippines became a dumping ground for inept bureaucrats. Inept meaning walay pulos. Uh, they do not have, uh, they were very incompetent. Uh, the bureaucrats were very incompetent. Their main criteria as to why they were sent to the Philippines was simply because of their loyalty to the king. They were loyal men to the king, but they did not have any merit as to uh, why they were being sent to the Philippines. They simply enrich themselves, having no interest in the Filipino people. They come to the Philippines as poor men, but return to Spain as rich men. And of course, as we all mentioned, as we mentioned a while ago, there was a failure to make or achieve consistent policies. Policies constantly change from time to time because of the changes in uh, government officials, in the governor general. And then we can also say that there was indeed political instability. There was indeed political instability. So the Philippines was verily affected by the uh, the political <clears throat> political situation in Spain. And you have to remember these four. No, these four characteristics. To the political development, if you look at these two, failure to provide for the basic needs, like public works, schools, and peace and order, taxes were never fully utilized, and limited participation of the Filipinos in government. Do you think the Filipino people would have just agreed to this, or do you think they would have went against the Spaniards after experiencing the, these three? Of course, they went for the latter. They said enough was enough. Why is there rampant corruption? Why were their taxes not fully utilized? Why did the government fail to provide basic needs for them, like public works, schools, and peace and order? Why was there limited participation? Why was the highest position that the Filipino can attain only a gobernador silio? Why was it only a gobernador silio? Why not Governor General? So they clamored for change. They wanted change. And they had enough already of what the, what the Spaniards were doing to them for more than 300 years. In the 19th century, they developed that sense of nationalism simply because they had enough. They were done with it. And they wanted to change the norm, so to speak. So... That's how Filipino nationalism developed as a result of the political development and, of course, the economic development. So these two are the reasons, one, two, for the economic development, and then for the political development, these two also, on how it accelerated Filipino nationalism. So that ends our discussion. Uh, our first discussion, first part of our discussion on 19th century Philippines. The second part will be, uh, I'll probably upload the video next week and I will talk about the cultural and the religious developments. Okay, thank you for listening and if you have any questions, just uh, comment on our Facebook group. Uh, please uh, refrain from PMing me for questions, but just comment on our Facebook group so that your classmates will see them also and will also see the answers, okay? So thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. Stay safe, everyone. Stay home and have a good day. Thank you.